no first use of nuclear weapons. Um, given how little time we have, let me just kind of be a little telegraphic. Um, it's important to remember that the issue of the conditions under which nuclear weapons might be used is actually the oldest debate in the field of nuclear strategy. It's actually older than nuclear weapons themselves. Even before the very first nuclear weapon had been assembled or tested, uh, there was a debate uh, in the US among the scientists who were working to make that first atomic bomb about what were the conditions under which this bomb might be used and what would it mean? And there was actually a petition from some of the Manhattan Project scientists to the US president on the issue of the first use of nuclear weapons, which was uh, expected to be against Japan at that time. And they actually urged the president not to use nuclear weapons um, against uh, any civilian or other target in Japan. They also, in a very important uh, observation, which I think bears on our conversation today, they said that it shouldn't be left to any leader of any country alone to make that decision about the first use of nuclear weapons. And they actually urged that any possible decision, uh, any decision about the possible use of nuclear weapons should actually be taken by the international community and with the support of public opinion given that this was a decision of such enormous consequence. Um, but as history shows, their advice and suggestion about how to think about such a profoundly consequential step was ignored. And the United States then dropped nuclear weapons on Japan, first on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. And those uses of nuclear weapons, um, you have to remember were against a country that didn't have nuclear weapons. And it wasn't about deterrence and it wasn't about retaliation or anything like that. It was the first use of nuclear weapons against somebody who couldn't retaliate with nuclear weapons. And at that stage, it was against somebody who couldn't retaliate against the United States at all, in fact. And I think this is the first observation I want to make, which is that so much of our conversation so far has been about nuclear war and the consequences for Americans and the people of the planet as a whole about what happens with the use of nuclear weapons. Steve Gallant talked about nuclear war, Ira Helfand talked about nuclear winter and so on. And all of these things are true and important. But if you actually think about it, the only uses of nuclear weapons, which were first uses, were against people who didn't have nuclear weapons and couldn't retaliate. And if you look at the threats by the United States, which are the threats we know the most about throughout the history of the Cold War, by and large, they have been against countries who did not have nuclear weapons, whether it was against Korea during the North Korea during the Korean War or against China during the Korean War or against China during the Taiwan crisis of the, between 1954 and 1958, or whether it was against Vietnam in the 1960s. And if you continue forward, even in the post-Cold War period, some of us will remember the discussions under the Bush administration about developing bunker buster bombs. And who were they to be used against? Countries that didn't have nuclear weapons. And so we have to keep in mind that a conversation about the first use and no first use of nuclear weapons should be broader than just the prospect of nuclear war where we ourselves would be in danger a far more credible risk of the first use of nuclear weapons would in fact be against somebody who couldn't retaliate, where there wouldn't be the prospect of escalation to large scale nuclear war. And just in that context, for those who um, read the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, there's an article that's just appeared based on a public opinion polling work done by a scholar in Israel and they found that 60% of Israelis now, who they surveyed, would approve of the use of an Israeli nuclear weapon against Iran, even though Iran does not have nuclear weapons. And this echoes a similar finding 
by uh, the Stanford political scientist, Scott Sagan from a couple of years ago, that 60% of Americans when asked would support the use of an American nuclear weapon against an Iranian city if American troops were actually in harm's way. So the point I want to make here is that thinking about asking presidents to adopt declaratory policies or even passing laws about nuclear use and whether Congress should be involved in any decision needs to keep in mind the political context within which decisions are made. Because it's so significant that when political leaders make decisions about consequential issues, they're either made in secret where the public won't know, as we saw in the case, for example, of the US use of torture during the war on terror, um, and of surveillance of Americans and others that Snowden revealed. But even having Congress involved would not necessarily change the political calculus that's at work, which is that knowing that the vast majority of Americans might support such a decision, they might go along with it. So one has to ask the question, as Tong Zhao quite rightly pointed out, what are the restraints that one can put in place on the decision-making process that go beyond just the enlightenment of a political leader or even of a few political leaders or a political institution. And there, I think that there is no substitute for a clear commitment by the public that they would not accept the use of nuclear weapons in their name as an action by their government. One, I think one of the key tasks we have to pose to ourselves is how do we create that condition? Because in my mind, that is a necessary condition for creating the context with each, within which any political decision or any political judgment would have to be made. And I'll end with just this observation that as we watch the slaughter, the, the disproportionate use of violence by Israel against Palestinians, that is unfolding in our screens. I remember the first time I saw this, and this was 1982, when we watched the Israelis pound Beirut, watching a city being bombed day after day after day. And there was relative silence from peace movements and activists around the world. And I think we have to ask the question that in the absence of a direct political participation by the public in these questions. There's only so much that you can expect from any political leader or any political institution unless we create a different political context within which they make decisions, especially of something as profound as the first use of nuclear weapons. And I just want to end with saying that we are now in 2021 and 60 years ago, in November of 1961, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed a resolution, and I'll just quote this and I'll stop with this quote. And the quote from the General Assembly resolution of November 61 says, any state using nuclear and thermonuclear weapons is to be considered as violating the Charter of the United Nations, as acting contrary to the laws of humanity, and as committing a crime against mankind and civilization. There was no issue of first use or second use, any use. And it's that sensibility, I think, that we have to bring back into the public sensibility and into the sensibility of the international community so that even the consideration of first use by anybody under any circumstance has to deal with the fact that there would be profound consequences domestically and internationally from considering such a decision.